Welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Sandy Mason with the University of Illinois Extension as the State Master Gardener Coordinator, and I am so glad you decided to join us. Here on Mid-American Gardener, we talk about all things gardening. So maybe you're already thinking about what you're gonna plant next year, but you can't quite decide. Or maybe you're thinking, maybe this fall, I can get some of those chores that I think I have to do in the spring. Maybe I can do them right now. Well, we're here to help you out with those kind of burning questions that I'm sure you have. We always have a great group of people to help you out, and tonight is no different. And uh, Jennifer, I know you always have lots of good info. So what do you have for us oh, this evening? Thanks, Sandy. I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist and I write a blog called Grounded and Growing. I like all things horticulture, particularly house plants and vegetables are my favorites. Um, I brought the difference between a holiday cactus because you may have what you thought was a Christmas cactus and you're wondering why it's blooming today, which is the week before Thanksgiving. That's because you probably have this guy, which is actually a Thanksgiving cactus. And if you look at the, the individual leaves, you'll see they're pointed. And most of the things that are sold today are actually um, Thanksgiving cactus, though they may say Christmas on them. <laughs> but a Christmas cactus is the one that I'm holding in my other hand, actually is rounded on each individual leaf, and those are gonna bloom more close to Christmas. So mine at home doesn't have hardly anything on it in terms of flower buds. The Thanksgiving cactus is getting ready to bloom. Um, this one's actually really old. It's from a, over a 100-year-old plant, so. And actually, you know, out of all the plants that I've ever gotten questions about, uh, as far as ones that people have had for years and years mm -hmm. and years, it's usually the, the Thanksgiving cactus it's, or Christmas cactus, yeah. people might call it, but you know, they've had it, their grandmother had mm -hmm. it or whatever, which is just a wonderful kind of tradition, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. But it's a lot of pressure though. If you're yeah, the one well, that's got, you know, grandma's, you know, Thanksgiving divide cactus. It, divide it, divide it, and it, have divide it, divide it, divide it. Growing in several places. It's yeah, also, yeah, spread out the liability. It's so one that right. I think also is the most easy to bring back into blooming again of all the holiday plants, because basically just leave it outside until it's the last thing you bring in and I've that's my foolproof way of getting it and to it bloom. works out well doesn't yeah. it the cooler temperatures at mm -hmm. night those Longer lower nights. daylight yeah absolutely good idea so, so thanks that's uh, thanks. one a lot of people have and then Bob uh, you always bring lots of <laughs> edible things for us well, uh, my, my name is Bob Skirvin I'm a retired professor of horticulture I taught 40 years at the university and one of the things that I love is going to the grocery store, and you should do that too. And, and every at different seasons, you get different things in the grocery store. Right now, there's a lot of interesting tropical fruits coming into the store. There's some really interesting grapes coming in South America, really, really interesting grapes, and some of the end of the season California ones. But it's, of course, right now is cranberries. And you have a bowl of cranberries here, you can see them. And you can see, you go to the store, and you got them there just like jewels. They're so beautiful, and it's all shiny, and it's lovely. And uh, it's, a, it's a Native American crop. It's been grown by a long time. There's a, rumors, anyway, that it really was that somewhere near the first, first Thanksgiving, the Indians had the Native, Native Americans ate this on a regular basis. And, and one of the things that's interesting about these things, they're terrible. I don't, they're not terrible. They're really sour. They're when, when you eat them, they're really, really sour. And you kind of wonder <laughs> why in the world do people eat these things? Well, it turned out that when the pilgrims came to, came to America, they, they were used to eating gooseberries. And they made a lot of recipes with gooseberries. And these kind of resemble gooseberries, about the same crispness as gooseberries. And so they substituted them in their gooseberry recipes, became popular, and they're st still around. Now, in the, so in the store, you can get these things. They're very inexpensive right now because it looks like there's a real glut in the market, it seems yeah. to me. There's a lot of, and they're, they're really good. You cook them down there. They're, you can't eat them fresh like that. They're really good at sauce. You just take and put them in a little, little, in a little bit of water, a little orange juice. Or, <clears throat> with a lot of sugar. You've got to have the sugar and cook it in. And it just turns the cranberry sauce. It's really delicious. It's really fun. It pops and it's, it's fun. I did it with my niece one time. We didn't put enough sugar. It decided to be economical. It was bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Try very something. good. Very, very interesting. I, actually, I like them fresh. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to you know, yeah, acquire once taste. Once you get beyond the fact anyway. that you're going <laughs> <Anyway. laughs> to... Anyway, and, 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 can, and Candace? <laughs> yeah, so I, hello, my name is Candace Hart. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension here in central Illinois. And my first thing here is a question. Um, this person has a banana plant as well as a succulent. Um, and they both have a white sticky dust like substance on them and they're saying that it's starting to kill their banana and someone told them they were aphids but nothing is kind of taken care of those so they're trying to figure out what they have here um, and i thought based on the photo here it actually looks more like mealybug than it does um, aphids which is a also a very common kind of household or house plant um, 
a pest, uh, and they can be difficult to take care of because, like in this photo, they like to hang out in the crevices, uh, in the crotches of leaves, that type of thing. So a couple of strategies on those is you can try to clean the plant really well. You can hose them off. You can try to wash them off as best as you can. Um, a cotton swab with rubbing alcohol is actually pretty effective, and you just dab the areas where those um, mealybugs are. They're coated with that white cottony substance, so that also makes them a little tricky to, to get rid of. So I would start with that, the cottony um, ball of rubbing alcohol. Uh, an insecticidal soap also can be effective here. And then if, if none of that works, unfortunately, sometimes you have to dispose of that plant or, or uh, sacrifice it for the good of the rest of your plants um, because they can spread. They have crawlers, so they can yeah. spread to your other house plants. So it's a tough one. Yeah, sometimes. that's a good yeah. one to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Because it, it is kind of confusing because they don't have, you don't realize they're insects because there's yeah. no like head and, you know, discernible mm -hmm. head yeah. and tail and legs. So yeah, they're easy to kind of miss. So mm -hmm. that cottony kind of stuff. So good, yeah. good. Thank you yeah. very much, Candace. And we'll have to think about sacrificing plants for the good of the cause. Sad, but sometimes. Yeah, sometimes it has <laughs> to happen. And, you know, a lot of times we talk about here about uh, toward the end of the gardening season that to go ahead and pick those green tomatoes before, you know, we actually get a cold spell. And that I just thought I would go ahead and bring the tomatoes that I actually picked green. And I these have been in my basement, so they didn't go through the cold spell. So they've been in my basement. So you can see some of them are still green. And then over time, they do go ahead and ripen. And so these are all, I actually have quite a few here, but they're, and they're all different sizes. But they, these are all just one uh, cultivar called Big Beef. Uh, and you can see toward the end of the season, you generally start getting the smaller ones, but that's fine. But how cool is that? You could actually have fresh tomatoes from your garden for Thanksgiving. You can amaze your friends and family. So it really does does work. So I'd, I'd love to show well, that kind of stuff. I've been told is you're supposed to take and wrap those in newspapers. Yeah, <laughs> usually often I, I do that only because sometimes you'll get a few of them that will go ahead and rot a little right. bit if they've had a little bit of damage on them, mm -hmm. you know, from insects or whatever. Sometimes they'll rot so it keeps them kind of fresh. Yeah, from that was great. I did one. that one year That's too. Great. We had nice big tomatoes and Okay, really great. Nice. Thanks. Thanks. Anyway, it can be done. So, <laughs> and we're going to go ahead and go to our callers and online too. We have Joe from Lovington and you have a question about pruning early blooming clematis or clematis, depending on how you want to say it. So, uh, Joe in Lovington online too. Yes. Uh, what <laughs> do we prune those things clear back to the ground? What time do we, when do we prune them? So really good question, like when do you prune clematis or clematis, however you want to say it. People often have that question. Mm -hmm. I can never remember it. Me either. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll tell you what I do. Okay. <laughs> I know it varies by the type of clematis, so I, I, yeah. I just I wait and see what is green yeah. in the spring, yeah. and I kind of go from there. Remove anything that's dead and um, just try to sort things out. And if something needs to be pruned back a little bit, do it then. But I very gingerly do it. I tend to err on the really, side of leave the green. That's what I do too. Yeah. Just wait and mm -hmm. see how yeah. much got killed back in the mm -hmm. winter and then remove the dead and just kind of let it grow yeah. from there. And so that's really the best bet. So that yeah. actually is one chore you could leave for spring yeah. exactly. for now. Mm -hmm. Just wait and see what greens up, what buds out, and then remove the, the dead stuff. So mm -hmm. that works out really well. So very good. Hopefully that helps you, Joe. <laughs> and on line three, we have a, a Rick from Shelbyville about winterizing a raspberry bush. So what can we do for yeah. you, Rick? Yes, ma'am. I was given a uh, about a foot tall raspberry plant this summer it's in a pot. I took it out and planted on the west side of a shed, and it's doing great. It's really spreading out. But how do I winterize that? Do I cut that back or anything? And do I need a, a, a trellis or something for it to climb to climb on? Good in question. The, it depends on what kind of raspberry you have, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it, in general, the, most of the raspberries that are sold in, here in Illinois and nurseries are are pretty much freestanding. And so what we recommend doing is you take and leave the plants alone. They're okay. You can send them out. There's some dead parts you take and cut that out and you, some obviously dead things. Leave it there and then just leave it. And then when it, it starts to grow, what, what we do is you have a pole <clears throat> on each end of your raspberry plants and take a piece of twine and kind of wrap, wrap it around like this <laughs> and, 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 and squeeze it together <clears throat> and the plants will stand up like this and you got, you got your raspberries in place. And it really, the raspberries are really quite hardy. You're probably not going to have a terrible problem getting, getting through the winter. Now later, later on next year when they start really growing like mad, they start getting suckers in, in between the row. Then you need to uh, thin, thin them out in the, in the winter time, getting down to about oh, six or eight plants per square foot. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, red, red raspberries especially are really quite invasive. And if you, if you, don't, you don't kind of rotate them down, they'll <laughs> take over your neighbor's yard. Yeah. Yeah. But at least the beauty of raspberries are you generally, they are winter hardy. So generally yeah. just what he was asking about winterizing, you probably really don't have to worry too yeah. much about yeah. that. Yeah. And that's great. And many of them flower, will actually, the fruits will actually come on the two-year-old cane. So you don't mm -hmm. necessarily, you won't necessarily want to cut them back every season because then you're going to lose some of that fruit. Too, right, so. right. Very good. So that's always a good one to have. So great. So thanks for that call. And on a line four, we have a caller from Champaign. You have a question for us on line four? Oh, looks like we lost it. Oh, looks like we lost line four. <laughs> so um, actually, one of the, you know, a lot of times people ask about winterizing things. And we actually had someone who emailed about actually they were going to wrap their roses in the winter with hay, you know, wrap the roses in the winter and then use hay, I, I assume, around that. But they were thinking maybe just to use some of the leaves that are all over the place for free, that, which makes sense. I'm always mm -hmm. into, you know, whatever's free. Do leaves give off heat like hay does? So this was an email. So, so if you are going to try to winterize something, kind of what are the basics of winterizing, whether it's roses or whatever? What do people need to think about? Well, one thing, don't use rose leaves. <laughs> don't yeah. use the rose yeah. leaves. Don't yeah. even yeah. make sure it's something else. Because otherwise, yeah. you're going to have the diseases right there as soon as the right. rose starts yeah. going. Exactly. So do clean up. Do yeah. a little clean up. Get rid of that because we don't want the fungus hanging out. Mm -hmm. So that's one Here's thing. Another. So does it matter if they use like hay or leaves or I mean, does it I, seem I to matter? I would be cautious about adding that sort of thing too early because it can invite all sorts of critters if you have mm -hmm. that sort of problem. We have a lot of voles by my house, so they love to just nuzzle up to a rose bush and snack on it all winter. So if you put too much protect, protection around it too early, I would yeah. wait until yeah, we, we get a good out, cold snap. At the farm, yeah. they put, put bales of hay or something to protect the plants. Is man, that's great for mice and all sorts of yeah. little yeah. rodents. Oh, Lord! Yeah. 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 It's an apartment so complex <laughs> for them. Yeah. So usually, yeah. I usually wait till like, even in December. Yeah, yeah. You know, December actually, January. Really cold. Yeah, wait till it's really cold, mm -hmm. and all the mice and voles have had somewhere else to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, so don't they don't see what you're doing. Yeah, yeah they don't <laughs> see what you're doing. Really, good idea, good idea. Okay, we have uh, on line two, we had Bruce Lee from Champagne about moving plants indoors. I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly, but uh, you have a, a question on line two about moving plants indoors. On line two? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I have uh, an indoor plant, but uh, I place it outside. Uh, during the summer, it looks okay, but uh, unfortunately, last week, when the, when the weather got very cold, I noticed that the leaves got wilted, and I put it inside, but still not uh, doesn't look it doesn't look healthy. Uh -oh. uh, my question: Can I keep it alive, or it's uh, hopeless? Do you know what kind of plant it is? Uh, uh, indoor. An similar indoor plant, the, plant, similar to the one behind you. I oh, oh, like maybe like oh, maybe like a fig, like weeping a fig, fig yeah. maybe. Fig. Okay, oh, what do you think? Watch and wait. Yeah. yeah. Remove anything that's dead right yeah, now. Yeah. What I would do is you take a little knife or something and take, you can take you know, cut up here if it's brown, it's dead, and mm -hmm. kind of go down until you get the healthy. Mm -hmm. healthy tissue See if it's green. Yeah. And, yeah. and then give it a chance after that yeah yeah, yeah you really it's really kind of a wait and see mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do at this point besides chances yeah. are it'll lose a lot of leaves yeah but especially you may be if it's surprised. a fig it's going to drop a majority and then hopefully put new ones back on but i am always one of those that i wait <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> until we really as long know as it's, possible. It's, too. yeah as long mm -hmm. as you possibly can but it is so it may very well drop leaves mm -hmm. as you said and then, uh, you know, sometimes we just forget that those house plants, you know, they're actually tropical plants. So mm -hmm. it's not just freezing, it's like even 45 or mm -hmm. so, or maybe even 50 that they well, it's like the basil. go through damage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah cold, when it gets a little yeah, cold. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes we forget. But anyway, you know, that's the beauty of gardening is that we learn. And then next time <laughs> we do something differently. So hopefully that helps you out a little bit. So hang in there. And on line three, we have Paul from Charleston and a mop head hydrangea that's not flowering. We always have to have hydrangea questions. <laughs> yes, so, Paul, what can we do for you? Hi, I've had these mop head hydrangeas for 13 years now. now. I've moved them a couple times, but they never flower. I bet I've only had 10 mop heads in the 13 years I've had them. <laughs> wow. Uh, <is> it, <laughs> do wow. you know if it's an older variety? Well, it's it's probably been here twenty or thirty years. Yeah. 
my bet is that it's a variety that probably only will flower on old wood and you're mm -hmm. probably dying, dying back to the ground just about every year. And so the new wood that comes up, the new sprouts that come up from the base are not going to flower. But only on that rare winter that what's surviving yeah. above ground. Wild enough yeah. Uh, but I give That's you a lot of bet. credit for being so patient, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> so you're willing That's very to. very patient. So what's, what's, what's the, you know, could they try to winterize it or what do you think? I guess they sometimes try, try I think new it's variety? time. New, vari new variety. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, sometimes it's just time to get, there's a lot of new ones. Mm -hmm. The newer that, ones are better. Yeah. yeah. So it may be one of those, unless it's a sentimental one, maybe you want yeah. to think about, you know, a shopping sacrificing opportunity. Sacrificing it, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sacrificing you know, it. Even the better of the garden. <laughs> even a totally different hydrangea, like a paniculata or something that mm -hmm. will bloom on, naturally bloom on yeah. new wood might be a, yeah. a better yeah. choice. Yeah, so unfortunately, unless you really want to do a lot, it may be one that just is not going to winter over well for you. So sorry about that. Anyway, and on line four, we have Robert from uh, Vermilion about uh, butterfly bushes. And what can we do for you, Robert? I'd like to know how do you winterize them. Oh, how to winterize them? Butterfly bushes. That's we a good don't. question, isn't That's it? A good question. I just leave mine. Me too. I just leave them in the fall, and then kind of like the clematis, I wait and see how far back it got yeah. killed in the winter, and then prune from there. So, um, so as far as putting any leaves on or anything like that, just I not worry about it. No, because no. it, it never kills it, but it typically gets killed pretty far. Pretty far right. down to the ground, and they grow so quickly that by the end of the season, they're back to the same size yeah. they were. Right. Yeah, right. I've had, I've had so a that's couple. Good. We like those answers mm -hmm. where we don't have to do much, right? Yeah. So wait till spring. Wait till spring. Very good. So we're going to go ahead and do our emails, our rest oh, of great. our emails here and stuff. So Jennifer. Okay, continuing with the hydrangea theme, <laughs> uh, I have a question from a viewer. She was away for a few days, and Japanese beetles ate about sixty percent of her climbing hydrangea. And the buds, the branches still seem to be alive. The lower portion of the leaves look good. There's new buds. She wants to know what to do about the damage. Should she cut it back, remove dead leaves, or just leave it? And it was in good health before the invasion. I say the good news is you should just leave it because <laughs> that's our theme tonight. <laughs> hey, Sacrifice less work, and leave it. Don't right? Do I'm all about less work in the garden. <laughs> Thing about um, Japanese beetles, it's usually just cosmetic damage, and especially when I saw it was climbing hydrangea, those can be really take a while to establish. So if you cut it back, that can really set you back a few years. I had a rabbit take hold of <laughs> nibble down one of mine, and I, it just took years to recover. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, good news. Just leave it. It'll be fine. So, and that's a great vine. People don't mm -hmm. always realize there is a climbing hydrangea. It's it has beautiful. very similar looking flowers, but it's really a beautiful mm -hmm. vine. It has really beautiful nice. bark that kind of um, exfoliates. Mm -hmm. It's so just something different very to good. try. Climbing hydrangeas. So don't worry about the Japanese beetles. No. Nope. All right. Very good. And Bob? <laughs> okay. I got, I got one here from Tim, whoever Tim is. Hello, Tim. <laughs> 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 anyway, it says, how do I keep my grapes from drying, drying up and falling off? Put plastic around the base or what, what do you do? Okay. So first, first of all, I was trying to figure out what in the world you're talking about the grapes falling off, and I think you were talking about earlier in the season. Now, the grapes, almost all the grapes have a real serious call, problem called black rot, mm -hmm. and black rot is a fungus, and it com comes in early, and then it can come in later and come in mid-season and get the plant, and it makes the grapes rot. And typically what they, they look like when they get black rot is they dry up, and they turn into little black mummies. They're just little, little hard things and they fall off early in the season it'll knock all the a lot of the uh, leaves off the, or the leaves the fruits off to begin with but as you're going along that's re that's really what the problem is now in order to control it you have got to you really need to get lots of air movement make sure it's not so dense that there's no air movement there to us if you don't want to spray and then you there are sprays and there's a ex pest management there's a book here and there's pest management for the home you, you can get on the internet the phone can't. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and they'll, they'll tell you how to, so what's, what uh, site to look for that, and it'll tell you how to spray. Now, the other thing is just because my, my first explanation I said that my grapes keep falling off, what's wrong? Should I put plastic around the base? I think what they they were thinking about sometimes when the grapes get, the clusters get big, the, some of the grapes start falling off. Mm -hmm. And that's usually not much of a problem because if they're starting to fall off, it's probably time to harvest your grapes. But the muscadine grapes, and, and they grow in the south down in Georgia and in Florida, then they have great big grapes. I don't know if you've ever seen them or not. They're great big grapes. They look like little plums. And the way they harvest those, they put a net under them and let them fall off. And as they mm -hmm. fall off, they pick them up that way because they don't ripen evenly. They just ripen. And so if you're talking, I don't think that's what you're asking about. 
but that is a possibility. If any ripe grapes are falling off, I'll try some. So it could be a disease issue or... Yeah, but it's, know, it's probably black shredded. rot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. So call your local University of Illinois <laughs> Extension <laughs> office <laughs> and... Yeah. and tell them black rot. Candace, yeah. <laughs> Very good. And Candace. Okay, so my question is regarding peonies. They have a uh, peony plant that they want to get a starter from, and they want to know what to do, what time of year to uh, to do that. And really, you kind of just miss the time, the ideal time. Uh, fall is usually what we recommend for either dividing a peony or uh, or moving a peony. So the best way to get a starter would be to divide a, an existing peony, which is I'm assuming is what you have. Uh, so dig up a portion of that peony in the fall, transplant it to your friend's house, wherever you're wanting to, uh, to take that to. Um, and then by the next year, it should be nice and well established and, and ready to go for you. So fall is kind of the ideal time. Spring, if you try to do that, you're going to throw off your flowering, which is obviously the, the main feature of a peony. So, uh, and if you try to do it in summer, it's, it's hot and you really have to water a lot. So fall is kind of your ideal time to do that. Okay, very good. So they just need to mark it on their calendar. Yep, mark it down for next year. Next September or so, it's time to do it. Okay, very good. And of course, this is uh, in Thanksgiving time. A lot of times people have sweet potatoes, but I just thought I would bring in some sweet potatoes just to sort of show people kind of how they grow. Because sometimes people just really don't understand quite how some of these things grow. Yes, they do indeed. It's like fought, fighting me here. So they do indeed grow in the ground. <laughs> this was actually attached. So these were all there together. So this was all one. Uh, and actually, I like growing sweet potatoes because they're easy to dig. You know exactly this is where the stem was. You know exactly where, the, where to mm -hmm. dig. White potatoes potatoes or the other reg regular potatoes, they seem to be all over the place. So at any rate, so sweet potatoes, really a great, easy thing to grow. And so we, uh, we're going to go to line two with Julia with Charleston. And do you have a quick question for us? Julia on line um, yes. two? Uh -huh. I just um, planted a weeping willow tree this summer and it's about 10 to 12 feet tall. And I'm trying to figure out what do I do now? Do I prune it? or how do I get it ready for winter? Weeping willow? I don't think there's really yeah. much of anything. No. Make sure it's watered well yeah. going into winter, really. Yeah, the yeah. only thing I would say is if it's grown that much, kind of think about what it's going to look like next year. <laughs> if, yeah. if, if it's, if it's too, close to, too close now. to your house, yeah. and you might want to move good. it right now, get your friends, uh -huh. and you can dig it. You probably still could still yeah. move it right yeah. now. And that, that's going to be a problem. If it's growing, that's going to be a big plant. So think about it. What's it going to do to your house? Right, very good. And I think probably any kind of new plants is probably a good time to really be thinking about the fact of like covering things for rabbits. Rabbits mm -hmm. love to eat like mm -hmm. any of our new plants. Yeah. So maybe thinking about thinking through <coughs> that a little bit. So that's good. So so a few things. So we had a lot of great callers tonight on different types of things going on. What we can wait for the springtime and uh, really uh, you know thinking about what things need to be winterized. I'd really encourage people to contact their local University of Illinois Extension office. Check out their Master Gardener program that's nearby. And really connect with other gardeners because you know that's really how we all learn isn't it mm -hmm. it's just from other gardeners and actually making a few mistakes once in a while that works out well too so I, i'm glad you all joined us here on mid-american gardener and i hope you'll join us again next week don't forget you can also you know contact us on uh, email facebook and actually uh we have thanksgiving next week don't we so at any rate so i uh, hope everybody has a great thanksgiving enjoy some sweet potatoes and maybe even a few tomatoes from your own Garden. And cranberries. And cranberries. <laughs> oh, cranberries. Sorry.